So welcome everybody. I see you're shy. You go to the you feel from the back to the front, but bring forward. So today's my great pleasure and honor to invite uh, Esteban Rossi Hansberg, who's our speaker. He uh, he's a professor in Department of Economics. Uh, he was joined the university actually about a year ago, was a little bit over a year, year and a half. But he was here on sabbatical before, and he's someone whose work I've admired and followed for a long time. Uh, as you learn about economics and models of how space comes into global equilibrium, and certain uh, transition costs and other spatial costs can produce agglomeration, so the formation of cities, but also uh, change the structure of how systems are wired spatially. These models become very important. And I think there were Kuzma's mobile plan in 98, just sort of an early version of that. He worked a lot on model by and extended them, looked at especially, you know, the population distribution of cities and so on. So I was very happy when they knew that you were coming because there are not many uh, proper urban economists among our many economists. So Stefan, I think, is, 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 is it. So it's a great pleasure to have him here. And we've been talking a little bit about how we understand Chicago, how we model Chicago, how we imagine this future. So I think a lot of you that doing studies like that, whether they're more data-driven or more modeling-driven. Uh, Esteban has a lot of ideas. So keep that in mind. So today, he's going to tell us about one of the great themes that we're all wondering about, right? About remote work and city structure. Um, you know that what's happening in the loop is kind of iffy. We don't know if people are going to come back. It's very sensitive. And this is happening throughout many cities, right? Uh, people are just taking stock of that problem. So. Um, Without much further ado, Esteban, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Please take it away. I think you were happy to take questions as we go. Is that right? That's correct. Um, yeah. So quite informal. Enjoy. All right. Uh, so great to be here. Thanks, Luis, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, so I'm an economist. Uh, I've thought a lot about cities. Uh, in fact, I started here. I did my PhD. In economics here at U Chicago, and and it was on, on city structure. So, and so today, what I want to talk about is um, this topic of remote work and the you know the the fact that we've all been forced into working from home at least partially, and kind of what are the consequences that this is going to have for. Uh, cities more generally, city structure, in particular cities more generally, and then ultimately we want to try to think about what are the effects uh, of uh, this for the economy. Um, and this is joint work, I should say, with uh, Ferdinando Monte and Charlie Porcher, who are uh, George. So, so like I said, I mean, so remote work, so which is just, you know, working from home, uh, is a growing form of labor delivery. Uh, it's become more efficient over time through Zoom and, and other types of uh, applications. And it, like I said, you know, help us all to, to deal with the pandemic to some extent and in some professions more than others. Uh, and so the question today is what's it, what, what is going to be the effect on, on the structure of cities? And I should, you know, preempt all of this by saying that you know, there's a lot of data and experience that we still need to go through in order to, to kind of have more definitive answers on this. But I want to kind of show you some of what the way we're thinking about it and some of kind of the results that we have so far. Uh, and so the basic kind of, kind of the mechanism at the core of everything that I'm going to show you today is the following. is the idea that, well, you know, as, uh, as Lee was saying, Cities are the result of agglomeration effects. The fact that you know when people get together, there's uh, good things happening. So there's ideas exchange, or there's a you know better labor market, or there's better exchanges of goods, or whatever brings people together. We know that firms and individuals are willing to pay to be in these downtown areas, in these kind of centers of economic activity, and so. You know, but then obviously, uh, and so that has, you know, that forms the core of our understanding of agglomeration and, and, the, and, the, and the reasons for the, or the existence of cities. And when you think about remote work, of course, one of the key issues is very simple, right? It's like, well, if people are not going, 
to the office, then they're not going to interact, and we're going to miss some of that, right? And, and but not only that, it be, it's because it's an externality, because when I go to the office, uh, I don't take into account or not fully the effect that I have on others, the, the fact that others are not going to have the benefit of interacting with me, it's the, that's a benefit or, or you know, and that applies to everyone, of course. Uh, that implies that, you know, I only want to go to the office, right? If, or I only get benefit of going to the office if everyone is in the office. But the, everyone else is not taking that uh, effect on me into it, right? So that's, that's why this is an externality. And so I want to go to the office only if everyone else goes to the office, right? If no one goes to the office, I don't want to go to the office because there's no one there. What's the point of commuting and paying all the costs of going to the office if no one is going to be there, right? And so then basic logic, and that's kind of all very simple, of course, that basic logic implies that we can be in a situation in which we have different types of uh, equilibria. Namely, we can all go to the office and that can be an equilibrium, right? Where we are going to the office. If we all find it worth it because, uh, because everyone else goes. Or we can be in a different situation in which no one goes to the office and everyone is happy not going to the office because they know that if they go, they're going to be the only ones there. And so that's kind of a coordination uh, issue, right? That, that, that happens and that, that can happen and can uh, put the economy or in particular city here into different situations where you're either everyone is, you know, we have like a booming downtown where everyone is commuting uh, to work. Or or not, right? and so and so that potentially is of course very important for the future of cities. Where are we going to be? What of these two the equilibria are we going to going to end up in? You know, after all this happens, we kind of and then the question we want to ask also is, you know, what to what extent is the pandemic, you know, affecting this? Because of course, one issue is that. You know, maybe we were in an equilibrium where everyone was commuting, right? It's not the only equilibrium, right? But we were all commuting, we were all coming to the office, and it just happened, you know, that we were all there, right, in this particular equilibrium. And then suddenly here comes the pandemic, and the pandemic pushes us all home, right? Sends us all home. And, then, and now we are, we, we start from, from, from from fresh, now we're going to, we need to go to a new equilibrium. Is it obvious that we're gonna go back to that original equilibrium where we're all commuting? Or maybe we're gonna get stuck and we're gonna go to the equilibrium in which we are not commuting, where we all stay at home, right? Uh, and so again, that, that's gonna have a, so the, the, the pandemic itself can have important effects on what equilibrium is selected. And, and that of course, in turn can vary uh, across cities, depending on the policies that they implemented and the, the, depending on the type of jobs that people have in those cities, etc. So that's kind of the, what we want to explore. So what am I going to do today? I'm going to show you uh, a, a model, a dynamic model of remote work and city structure. Then uh, I'm going to show you how this uh, logic that I just briefly outlined today kind of pans out in the model. And then I'm going to take a, a particular example of New York and San Francisco, combine, kind of estimate the model, uh, and then, uh, you know, give you some predictions of what the model tells us about what's going to happen in New York and San Francisco, and then some corroborating evidence that we think this is exactly uh, what we see, or not exactly, but it's kind of related to what we see. Okay, so, uh, so this is a dynamic model. Of a, of a city, so think about one city, and, and the city structure is gonna be relatively simple. Uh, there's gonna be a downtown area, the, uh, the CBD, the Central Business District. Everyone is gonna commute, or if they commute, they're gonna commute to work there. So all the jobs are in that center. This of course can be then generalized to multiple centers, to whole density of jobs, et cetera. So, but let's keep that uh, stylized uh, model for a second. So, so, so everyone goes commutes to the center, right? And then we're going to live around that center. I mean, for those of you that know a little bit about urban economics, you know that's your classic uh, 
uh, urban uh, urban mall. Everyone lives around that center, is commuting in, and uh, and they are gonna they are gonna choose the characteristics of their house, what I'm calling the quality of their house. There's gonna be some landlords that are gonna supply uh, supply those houses, and then these agents are gonna have to decide whether they wanna. Uh, commute to their job, or they want to uh, work from home. And the way I'm going to model remote uh, remote work is you don't you don't stay at home every day. You stay at home a few days. Okay, so that's the option is stay at home a few days. So that's a parameter that later how many days is a parameter that I'm going to call new uh, in a little bit. Okay, and so these these agents that are uh, deciding whether they want to commute or they want to uh, work from home, and they're deciding this every every period, um, subject to some cost of future, right? So, so maybe you know, once I uh, if I'm commuting all the time, etc., staying at home is not very practical because I need to set up my office there, etc. So I'm going to have to uh, pay a cost as a result. Of and so, what's the trade-off that these agents are going to be facing? They're going to say, well, you know, if I don't go to work, I have lower commuting costs, lower rents. Because I live kind of farther away from the center, where let, rents are a little bit lower, or I have the option to do that, uh, you know, I can stay home, and that there may be some amenities from doing that. But at, at the same time, I don't get all those interactions, and so my productivity and wages may be uh, maybe lower as a result. Of that. Okay, so so that's going to be the key trade-off: is I don't commute, I get some amenities from being at home, against you know, I'm not as productive and I don't interact with my colleagues and I get high, lower weight. Okay, so, you know, uh, so let me show you, show you a few equations and I promise not too many. Uh, so this is the uh, utility of a person that has a particular mode of commuting L, which can be commuting or, uh, or stay at home. Commuting is C, staying at home is M, right? And, uh, these agents are going to have some idiosyncratic preference for, for that as well. So, you know, maybe you're a parent, you just had a kid, and then uh, you want to stay home to take care of the kid, or it's more practical for you to do that. And so then remote, the remote option is kind of a more natural option for you, right? So that's going to be given by these epsilons here. And so what's the utility of such a person is this is an indicator function. If you're a commuter, then this is your utility. If you're a... Uh, and staying at home, this is your utility, and then depend, like I was arguing, on the number of, of commuters in the city. So this is again the logic. I'll, I'll show that to you in a little bit more detail in a moment. This is this is just just in terms of the notation, capturing the fact that my utility as a commuter depends on how many other people are commuting. Okay, so this is just my current ut period utility, and then tomorrow. You know, I discount the future at some rate beta. So that means I value tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow's utility a little bit less than today's. Uh, and then, you know, tomorrow I have, I, I get another option to switch potentially uh, to other forms of commuting. I get another wage, et cetera. And so this V captures all that future, right? The expected value of all that future. If I decide to switch, from commuting to not commuting or vice versa, then I uh, I have to pay this cost. So this cost is given by this F here. Okay, so that's gonna allow us, for example, to match, uh, you know, the fraction of people that commute or not commute, the flows of people that switch from commuting to not commuting, that type. Okay, and this B, this is the definition of this B here, which is just this expected value of future, of future utilities. No, it's something, sorry, it's just how the, the utility of being at home also yeah. depends. Is it because it's a compliment or something on the people that show up? Yes, because I'm going to allow you to go to the office a couple of times. Okay. okay. Right, I mean, okay. so, so, so it's not. But in principle, in principle, you don't, you don't necessarily need this. Right. And then there is this object here that I'll define, I'll show you, show it to you in more detail in a second, is the Z that is uh, the value of stamp. So, so, so how productive are you? Okay. And it's just another question while I have you. Yeah. The, when you are looking to the future, the V is integrated over the future. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming that I know those. I can estimate them. 
I know the future. You don't know oh, yeah. these idiosyncratic ones. Oh, those are noisy. You're taking expectations oh, over okay. that. Got it. So Got that's it. the noisy part. Got it. Right. And in fact, the fact that these are noisy will come from a type one extreme value distribution implies that I'm going to be able to, 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 to have a model or, or, or know the structure of the transition probability. And so given that those transition probabilities, the fact that I get those transition probabilities is what allows me to solve this model, right? And so this is kind of an important assumption, having some spreading out of the production for the community or the community. Okay? And so this is the utility of a particular mode, right? So this is what I showed you. In, I mean, I, I showed you the value of that in the previous one. This is the actual utility of a particular mode. And so here is all the structure of the problem. If you if you stay at home, that means that you stay at home a fraction mu of days, okay? And so the rest of the days, one minus mu, you go to you commute. And so so what am I? What's your utility? Well, I'm gonna you, well you consume something, and that whatever you consume, uh, these are goods. Uh, depends on where you live. So please, how far away from the CBD you you live? Then you consume some housing. So obviously the price of housing is gonna depend heavily on how far away you are from the CBD. This is what we were talking about before. And I'm just gonna aggregate these in, with this, this functional form, which is called Cobb Douglas and commonly used in economics, right? So this is, this, is, this is what I consume. This is what I consume of housing, depending on where I decide to live, which is this D, right? Uh, and these are choices for the individual. And then, you know, I get some value from, from living at, from uh, staying at home P uh, in terms of utility. I get, uh, and then, you know, this is just kind of a full set of things that I, that I could get. I, you know, if I go to the city, I may enjoy that because there's some amenities, some restaurants in, in, the, in the downtown area. And uh, that also depends on how many people go there. So that's that uh, sign. Uh, but if I go, you know, there's congestion. And so I need to, if you know, lots of people are commuting, there's gonna be congestion on the roads. And so that's this term here. And of course, if I'm far away, I have to commute for longer. That's this term here. And then I have a budget constraint, which is my wage. My wage is gonna depend on, well, if I go to the office, Right, then I meet other people in the office. That makes me more productive. At what rate? At this rate delta, right? And that again depends on how many people go to the office. That LC. If I stay at home, though, I get a, then, like Luis noted, you know, my productivity doesn't depend on how many people commute, right? So, th so that's this Z to the, right? So I just get Z. So at home I get Z. If I go to the office, what I get depends on how many people go to the office, which is this term here. How much does it depend on how many people go to the office? That's delta, okay? And so just in, and then, you know, I spend my income in consumption and uh, housing where R is the, the cost of housing. Okay, so this is just the agent's problem. Uh, and this is for a, a person that stays at home. And then, you know, the same thing, but just setting mu to zero, would be the equivalent problem for someone that commutes. Okay, so this is uh, this is this is the agent's problem, and, and I want you to just point to two things. Look at the blue the blue parameters here are what I'm going to call the agglomeration parameters. So this is if lots of people go to the office, I've paid more. That's governed by delta, right? And if lots of people go to downtown areas. It's more fun to be there and go to the restaurants or go or you know go through the city. That's that side. Okay, so these are the agglomeration effects, and then I have some congestion parameters, which are this theta and this gamma in red. Which is if lots of people commute, then uh, then then the roads are more busy, right? And so there's some congestion there, and I don't like that. And uh, gamma tells me. Uh, if I, ver I live very far away from the city, uh, then, uh, then I don't like it either. I, distance is, uh, is, is, is bad. So this is the elasticity of transportation cost to distance to the city, okay? And so these, these two are agglomeration, these two are congestion, 
And so in general, what's gonna happen in all these models is that the balance between these congestion parameters and agglomeration parameters determines whether we are in a situation where this type of multiplicity that I was uh, pointing to happens or not. And the basic idea is the following, if agglomeration effects are very strong, right? It's very easy to be in these multiple equilibria situations. Well, if congestion effects are very strong, it's harder, okay? And so you can actually show that and say, uh, so that's this uh, proposition here that says, well, if the blue objects, right, are uh, smaller than the red objects here, then uh, the, the stationary equilibrium is unique. So, that, so we're in a situation where this multiplicity issue that I was talking about at the beginning doesn't happen, right? Even if you have the reverse, then it, it can happen. And so, and so in a graph, this looks like this. So if delta plus, these are the, these are the blue things, if that object is uh, below this object, these were the things that were in red, should be in, in, in red in this graph would be nicer, uh, then, then you're, you're in the unique region. But if the agglomeration effects are large enough and the productivity of working from home relative to the productivity for working in the office is large enough, then you can be in this region where you have multiple equilibrium. And so that's the region where you can get stuck in the, in the non-commuting activity, okay? So, so, and so, and so this, this, this triangle here, I mean, this is like a cone, right? This cone, uh, the larger the agglomeration effects are, the larger the set, sorry, the larger the set, right? So here is very small, here is very big, here is super big, the larger the set of Z's over A's, that would give you more precision. So, you know, how, how good do I need the Zoom technology to be in order to fall into this situation? That's what this is telling, right? Z, think about Z as that. How good do I need the Zoom technology to be to fall in the situation where we are all then, you know, stay at home and we're happy staying at home? Yeah. I think you had a question in the chat and I got locked off, but I mean, yes, if you don't mind. Um, so Chris Esposito is asking, um, is the quantity of commuters in the city or the firm? Oh, the city, the okay. city. So we're thinking the, the, everything is at the city level because we think that, you know, firms, I mean, some of it can happen at the firm, but the firms have, a, you know, Luis can say, okay, I'm gonna have nice lunches and coffee and everything to encourage you all to come to the office and kind of internalize the externality. He can internalize the externality. For the city, that's much harder to do, right? And so to the extent that you don't internalize the externality, then you're gonna have the type of problem that, 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 that we have. Come on, can I ask you something else? Sure. So initially at the pandemic, for those who could work from home, C was equal to A, I guess, in the sense that people didn't necessarily at least probably for us it was, that we would get the same compensation yeah. without having to come to the office, right? And uh, so in that in that case, uh, probably working from home almost always makes sense, right? Is this what that, this is saying? It's like the Zoom is super good, right? It's almost as good as... Right, so, so if Zoom is, is perfect, perfect, right? And it's the same as what I would get if I went to the office and everyone else went, went to the yeah. office, then we're all gonna stay home right. because there's other costs of uh, commuting like what you're seeing. But, but I would argue that uh, even in that case, you know, when we go into the data and estimate pre-pandemic discounts in wages mm -hmm. for people that were commuting versus not commuting, and getting discounts, Vary by sector, vary by uh, occupation, maybe six, seven percent. So you know, so with the technology we start, that we started the pandemic with, mm -hmm. there was a clear discount in terms of uh, what you could do uh, at home versus the office. But who's paying for that? The firm or the or the wage earner? So so ultimately. Um, at least in the I mean, short term. During the in the very short term, probably the firm. Yeah. In the longer term, I'm gonna say the work. It has to. Right. I mean, unless somehow for some reason the worker uh gain all the bargaining power. But you know, 
they're probably sharing some of the bargaining power in their relationship. And so that means that at least the worker is going to get charged for part of it. Okay. And then that will correspond to this and decision. Then, and, then, and then that's what you Exactly. Okay. So so then so then think about so we can we can describe this kind of situation that I've been talking about with this diagram here. So think about this diagram. This is like a the, the, the way the dynamics work in this model. So and the basic state variable, the key state variable that we need to take uh, keep track of is the number of commuters, right? So that's the dynamics uh, of how the city is gonna is gonna evolve. And so what I have here, focus on the one here on the top uh, left. So this is the number of commuters at some point t, right? And this is the number of commuters at uh, next period. So so t plus one, right? 45 degree line, if we're in a point at the 45 degree line, that means that if there's LC commuters today, tomorrow there's also gonna be LC to commuters. And so that means that we're in an equilibrium, in a stationary equilibrium. The number of LCs are not, is not changing over time, right? And so in this first diagram here, that's exactly what's happening here. If we have LC here, that's exactly the number tomorrow. Then tomorrow we start here, that's the, the, the number after one day after tomorrow and so on. We stay there, that's a stationary equilibrium, right? So all the crossings of this curve here on, on the uh, relative to the 45 degree line with the 45 degree line, uh, that, those, that gives us a stationary equilibrium. And so, and so what happens, how can we represent this issue that I was telling you that as you increase these agglomeration effects relative to the congestion effects, what happens, what happens is that this line, which is the, the, the behavior of these agents, starts to get this S shape. And so, and so this S shape means that, well, in this case, you know, you increase it, you still have only one equilibrium here. But then as you move from this situation to this situation, if I also increase the quality of Z, so the character, so how good it is to be on Zoom, right? Then I'm shifting this curve up and down. And so then I can end up in a situation like this where I have this multiplicity. So this is the case of the multiple stationary equilibrium where I had like this equilibrium here, right? But now I have these other ones too. This, I have this one in the middle and I have this one here at the bottom. And in this one at the bottom, there's very few, few people commuting, right? In this one at the top, I have lots of people commuting. And so you see this, uh, this different, so these are very different cities, right? This is a city where everyone is staying at home, right? This is a city where, you know, it's like business as usual, where everyone is commuting as they, as they have so far. And so the question is, you know, are we in this situation or are we in that situation? So we know that the Zoom technology has, has gone better all right, so we know that there's a long-term trend reducing exactly this gap between what you know remote workers earn and what commuters earn. And so we know we've been moving in this direction, right? And, uh, and then there's a question of, well, how, how important are agglomeration effects relative to congestion effects to know whether we're in the first row or the second row? And so in some sense, the problem or potential problem is that we're here, Right, we're in a situation like this, right, where we could end up in this equilibrium. Okay, and that's the question that we have. Could could it be the case that we end up in this equilibrium here, at least for some of uh, of these cities? This is for one single city. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Yeah. Um, from Chris Esposito again. Um, so he's asking: These are single city equilibria, right? Single city. Yeah. Um, so this is keeping no migration, which is interesting to think about um, relaxing as more productive cities grow through in migration. Definitely. So so this is this is for one one individual city, and there's gonna be there's some other problem, which is you know to what extent there's competition across cities in uh, in generating uh, in changing their size. So 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 that's an interesting problem as well. I agree. Uh, okay, so but let me just just give you the basics of this. Then you know, so so let's start with the first situation that I described. So now, now you know we're happily there in this uh, in this one equilibrium, and then uh, now let's think about the pandemic, right? So what did the pandemic do? 
the pandemic, we were all commuting, right? And then it sends us, sends us home. So now no one is commuting, right? And so what would happen if this is the situation in which the city is? Well, one more thing's happened. So we're, we're in the situation we were sent home, but one more thing's can happen, which is that, you know, this mu, the, the number of days that you could stay home increased, right? So suddenly, you know, firms were much more uh, relaxed about in the future, can you stay one day or two days or three days at home? You know, now uh, it's viewed before it was perhaps viewed as not the right thing to do. Now it's easier to do. So mu changed. So we're kind of, and so that kind of changed that curve and created that S shape that we were talking about before, right? But we're still in one, one crossing, right? And so what happens if everyone sets, is, uh, gets sent home? We, we essentially go back, right? Slowly, but eventually we go back. We're back into our original equilibrium. Everyone is commuting. And so this is definitely one potential story of what's going to happen to all these cities, right? <laughs> that, you know, we were sent home and then we're slowly recovering. And this recovery may be slowed down in certain parts, et cetera, but eventually we're going to be back. Uh, now, what happens if the Zoom technology is good enough? If the Zoom technology is good enough, we would be starting there. So the same way we, we were uh, commuting a lot, right? We were there, we were sent home, then the mu increased, and now we have these three equilibria. And so, and so then, then what happened? Now we're here, right? We're in the pandemic in the middle of the pandemic. And now what's gonna happen? Well, we go back, but we go back here. There's no way we get back to the new equilibrium, to the old equilibrium here. We get stuck in this one. We just get stuck in that one, right? We would never be here if, if we were not, if, if the pandemic had not occurred and we had not been sent home, right? We would not be, in this situation, because you know this is still an equilibrium, right? We could still be there, but the fact that we were all sent home implies that now this is where, where the dynamics are going to take, take us. So, so now I can take this model and take this diff for different cities and allow and, and estimate all these different parameters, so these deltas and c's and thetas, et cetera, using a number of uh, data sets for cities in the United States, okay? And in particular, I can use all the flows of uh, people from being a commuter to a non-commuter. I can estimate the gaps in, in wages that they receive in different occupations and then build that at the city level from the combinations of occupation that operate in that city, right? And essentially get an estimate of all the different parts of the model that I've been, uh, that I've been discussing, okay? And so if you do that, now I have the specific cone for each specific city, and I have the particular point in terms of the Z over A where each city is. And so I'm not gonna go through all the details of that estimation, but you can do that. And, and, then, and, then, and then let me let me kind of illustrate this with, uh, with two particular uh, examples, which is uh, the case of New York and the case of San Francisco. And so what I have in this graph is the original cone right, where we were, New York was before this change in mu happened. And now I allow that mu to change. And so that changes the multiplicity cone uh, for, for New York. It started there and then it moved into to here. And then I'm plotting the point where New York is, which is the combination of Z over A and delta uh, for New York. So, so, so here is New York. If the point is inside the cone, we know we're in the multiplicity region. If the point is outside the cone, 
we know that we're not in the multiplicity region, right? So this was the original cone. New York was far from it. This is a new cone. New York is closer to the multiplicity, but far, but, but not in, right? And so that means that for New York, this story, this possibility of getting stuck in that not commuting equilibrium where very few people commute is not really an issue, right? Or at least according to these numbers and this estimation. Right? In contrast, right? This was the previous cone for uh, San Francisco. And then we move from this cone to this new cone. And in contrast to New York, now San Francisco is very much inside this, inside the cone. And so that tells us that, well, potentially for San Francisco, right, we have this multiplicity issue. Right? And so that means that San Francisco can get stuck, according to this, uh, this theory, can San Francisco, in this estimation, San Francisco can get stuck while New York cannot. Okay? And so what would it mean for San Francisco to, to get stuck while uh, in the non commuting equilibrium relative to New York. One way to look at it is to look at the rent gradient in these cities. So when I look at the CBD and I look at rents as you move out, right? If no one is commuting, there's no reason why rents close to the CBD should be large relative to rents farther out, or there's less of a reason. So that gradient should be very flat, right? And so in places where you know, no one has to commute anymore, that, rent, that gradient is gonna be very flat. In places where people are commuting, it's costly to commute. Because it's costly to commute, I'm willing to pay more to be close to the CBD. So that gradient should be steep, right? And so I can calculate that gradient and I can do that very nimbly in, for, for cities uh, at a kind of very granular level uh, at high frequency. And, and so that allows me to trace that gradient over time and see what happened in these two, two cities or what has happened in these two cities. And that's what, that, that's what you see here. So what you see here is, so this is the distance gradient for, uh, this is New York, that's San Francisco. For, 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 for New York, I'm normalizing this to zero in the first period here, which is uh, January, 2019. Right? And you can see like pre-pandemic, this gradient was more or less stable, right? So it was, it kind of stayed uh, around my normalization there of 10. You can see the actual number. I mean, the actual gradient is 0.138. That's the, that number, right? But then, you know, it stayed kind of constant more or less. And here comes the pandemic. And I mark that with, uh, with the dashed line. I mean, there were also like formal lockdowns. People could not, you know, actually go to work. And so, you know, naturally, what did that do? It lowered the grading. So that's exactly the logic that we were talking about, right? So suddenly people don't have to go to the, to, to the center anymore. So they're more willing to live farther out and they're willing to pay more out than close to the CBD. There's no reason to pay San Francisco rents anymore, right? If I can live, you know, one hour away or one and a half hours away and pay, you know, one tenth of my rent. And so, and so that, uh, and so that flattened the rent gradient. And we see that pretty much in every city in the United States. So we see this drop, right? We, here is San Francisco, so that's New York, here is San Francisco, it was again kind of flat, and then you see the drop, right? And in fact, you know, at the, at the, at the third here, you know, that's actually negative, meaning, you know, there, there was no grading. The grading was, if anything, kind of a little bit reversed. Um, so, but are these, um, are these uh, office rents? Are they, or are they prices of housing? Oh, sure, sure. sorry, I can say where you get this from. Yeah, so, so, so this is, these are Zillow, Zillow yeah. rents, yeah. actual observed rents, rents, not prices. And these are, um, and there's an issue, of course. I mean, I'm talking about the, 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 the gradient relative to the CBD, right? Now, of course, there's businesses, like we said, I mean, there's businesses everywhere and people are doing all sorts of commute, commutes. So the way we did that, click on this. It's kind of fun. 
So, so here's a bunch of cities. I mean, these are the two that we were talking about, right? Is uh, take this uh, safe graph data. So safe graph is uh, data on your cell phone. It tells, uh, it tells uh, the company where you are, right? And so what they can do is essentially trace, you know, where people are at, uh, at different points in time, as long as you have your cell phone on and some maps are operating, et cetera. And, and what they do is they, uh, they see where you sleep. They see where you spend most of the day, right? And, if, and, and so if I see that you are going to a place every day during the week, I'm going to say, that's your job. Right, and so these are, and so and so we can look at that data and we can say, well, what are the places where people are going to work, right? What are the, the, the and so and so and so that defines the CBD, and you know, I mean, it does a good job in terms of what you would see, right? I mean, this is like downtown Manhattan, Midtown there. Here's Chicago for you, so that's exactly the downtown area, right? So. So this kind of identifies it, but not in a way that is just like the center of the city, like in a, in a, in a basic way, but it kind of data data based uh, way with this uh, with this with this type of thing. Um, there's some just questions in the chat too. All right, um, I see all these things. Um, it's very active uh, discussion there. Yeah. So he's. Um, asking, could the rebounding of New York's um, city's gradient also be explained by the return of its endogenous or urban amenities? Yeah, could be. I mean, for sure. Uh, but I mean, this is. I mean, uh, absolutely. But you know, in some sense, the 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 whole agglomeration effects that we have include both. Include the wage effect, the delta. That was the delta effect, and then the other effect is that C effect. And those are, you know, to the extent that that's. Uh, that's exactly that. That's, you know, restaurants are there, etc. We all want to live in New York because restaurants are there. And so that could very much be uh, the reason, kind of the, the, the source of that externality. That can definitely be the case too. But you see, but, but, but I mean, that's anticipating what I was going to say, which is exactly uh, this issue of, you know, this is flat, came down with the pandemic, right? So this is January 2021. And then look at New York. So New York, you see it come back up. Right? And then kind of stabilizing again, it's more or less at the same level. It's even a little higher. I mean, it, it's not significant. I see the uh, yeah, maybe a little, but I mean, it's not right. But and and in in, in 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 contrast, look at San Francisco, right? So for San Francisco, it seems like a very very different story. It comes, it's flat and two, it's flat two up to the lockdown comes down. It comes down more or less the same, right? Then it just stays. In. Doesn't it doesn't it doesn't seem to have uh, reverted, and so this is clearly you know what this logic tells us, right? New York is in the one the one equilibrium. So if you're in the one equilibrium, that's the one equilibrium. You have to go back, right? That's that point, right? In San Francisco, on the other hand, you have the multiplicity, or you're at least in that region of multiplicity, and so and so the. Sending you home implies that it's going to be hard to come back because you're going to get stuck in that equilibrium with a lot of uh, uh, people that are staying home. And, that, and this data on rents seems to, su to suggest that that has some bite, that this is something that is actually uh, happening happen in these places. So let's take and you a question. Oh, yes, of course. Sorry, quick, quick question. So um, at what radius is this is the gradient measured at so is this like the difference between rents like the loop versus lincoln park or versus evanston or champagne or, or what is the census group group uh, is the census group uh resolution so so essentially we're saying saying census group is what is like a few blocks you know, blocks, 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 like blocks. three thousand yeah, or something so Right, so 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 that's the, that's the that's the level. So that's the unit. So so the way we're doing it is that's the unit. You identify the the max, right, and then you identify the max. And as long as the surrounding ones have at least the eighty percent of the max, you include them in what we're calling the downtown area, those red areas that I showed you, right. And then uh, at some point that stops, and then and then you are not calling it the. Uh, 
you're not calling it the CBD anymore, then, then we're calling it the, the you know, residential area. And that's where we're measuring the, with the green. But does the residential area go out like to the whole country or is it, you know, it's some area, you know, around the city? Oh, like, it's the MSA. It's the, oh, I see. Okay. That's the, the boundaries of the overall city. That's the MSA. Uh, right, but I mean, this is this is. I mean, man, there's there's. I I shouldn't take too much credit for this because I, this part, the part of the fact that this decline is kind of donut effects essentially. It's like a donut effect, right? Because it just made people go to the suburbs and that increased rent in the in suburbs. I mean, there's many papers that, that that have kind of identified that and talked about this donut effect. What, it, what we're trying to emphasize is, well, do you stay in that donor effect or do you come back? And that depends on this, uh, this basic story that varies across places. And it varies across places because this agglomeration and congestion forces across places are very di different, right? And why are they different? Because what you do in San Francisco is different than what you do in New York, right? So it, dep if, it depends on whether you're talking high tech industry or whether you're talking finance, right? And the, and the agglomeration effects for those uh, different industries are uh, are different, and that leads to this type of uh, this type of, uh, of 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 effects here. And you can and we've done it for many cities, so you can. I mean, there's more examples here, I think. Uh, right. I mean, here's a, a few more. Uh, right. So these are the two examples that I showed you. You see, Chicago. Chicago kind of seemed like it was going to come back, but then uh, we don't quite see it. Boston is all the way back. LA is down. Seattle is kind of down, right? So these are these are clear examples. You see, you see, kind of, it's a little bit more nice. It depends on on the different cities, but um, but you but you can do it for you can do it for 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 many of them. And some, I mean, it also depends a little bit on on you know how spread out employment is and how good of a measure these gradients are for the type of phenomenon that we are capturing in New York. Is, I mean, in New York, we know there's a lot of commuters. There were a lot of commuters and the downtown areas are kind of very well defined. And uh, in San Francisco, kind of similarly, in LA less so. Uh, so there's, uh, and, and Boston perhaps a little bit less, less so too. Uh, Chicago was a little bit of a surprise for us in the sense that we, we thought it would be more in the New York uh, category than what we are finding. And, and, you know, again, it seemed like a little bit of a run up back, but then, uh, but then you see it declining a little bit. I mean, it's all, it's all not, you don't have a lot of power to, to, to make it very precise. So, 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 that, so there's a question how much you want to make of it. Uh, Okay, so that's most, most of what I have. Of course, there's, there's kind of potentially corroborating evidence that one wants to, you want to put together with this, which is to see actually measure the actual number of commuters across, uh, across location. And there's some, some option to do that. It's not that, easy, it's not that easy to do it at this frequency. So that's where the rent data is particularly, particularly useful. But eventually, of course, what you want is to have to match this type of uh, uh, effect on prices with the actual flows, right? With the actual flows of commuters. And so that's, that's what I was saying at the beginning. That's kind of the type of data that we're still kind of waiting a little bit to, to, come, come, uh, to come to us uh, so that we can, uh, we can match it to, to this type of uh, price data that we seem to be, we seem to be getting. Okay, so that's pretty much all I got for you. Uh, so, so, so let me just conclude. So, so what is the what was the point? The point is uh, there is a, this form of uh, work delivery that is becoming more and more important. The technology is getting better. The norms in the in the workplace uh, about doing it, about doing meetings in remotely, about uh, you know, uh, interacting remotely have changed. And so to the extent that that has happened, 
this is this is going to have an effect on our cities because commuting is obviously such a central aspect of urban life, uh, and so and and, and it's going to affect the distribution of prices across locations, etc. Um, and 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 what I outline essentially is this basic argument about the multiplicity of the stationary equilibrium that can, in principle, change dramatically the structure of these cities, at least for some of these cities. Right? And the fact that we see this kind of persistent lower gradient, even after in some, you know, under some criteria, et cetera, there's some discussion about this, uh, the pandemic has uh, subsided, we still see it very, per, uh, very persistent effects at the, the, in, in city structure, right? So there's a question of why is it? Why is it that we didn't go back to normal? Why didn't we go back to normal? If, if the pandemic is gone, maybe it's not completely gone. Maybe still some people are getting sick, etc. I'm not saying completely, but you know, but we're seeing big, big changes at, at the city level. And so why are these so persistent? And this is kind of a theory of why they can be persistent, and it seems to have some empirical bite. Right. There's still a lot of verification, et cetera, that needs to be done, but there's this basic idea that this kind of different coordination in different cities can get you stuck in some of these, uh, in some of these different activities. Now, an, an important future part of this agenda that we haven't really, uh, you know, makes make a lot of progress in is to then take this, this type of models once you kind of quantify them as the, in the way that I described, and then start asking the questions, is this good or bad, right? Is it, is it a plus? I mean, do you want to be in the low commuting equilibrium? Does the city want to be in the low commuting equilibrium? Or do you want to be in the, in the commuting equilibrium? Do you want to go back, right? Is it clearly a plus or, or is it a minus? Or does it depend on the particular characteristics of the city, et cetera? Because of course, the equilibrium that you get stop in doesn't determine whether that's a good situation or not exactly because it's an externality. So it may be that, you know, if we get stuck in the non-commuting equilibrium in the remote or, you know, heavily remote work um, equilibrium that, you know, it's very good for the environment. We don't use our cars, right? It's certainly good for congestion and we save uh, an hour a day commuting, right? But, uh, but we, we may be sacrificing big effects in terms of productivity and new ideas, right? And so how does that balance ultimately work out? Uh, it's, it's of course an important, uh, an important uh, part of this agenda moving forward, whether it's good to get stuck in the non-commuting equilibrium or not. Anyway, I'll stop there. Great. Minutes for questions. Um, for those in the uh, virtual, if you want to speak up, uh, I know Chris and Keith, you guys had some questions, so feel free to unmute yourselves and um, speak up. So I'm calling in. Uh, can Can you guys hear me there? I'm calling in from a busy airport terminal. Um, is it Is my voice coming clear? Okay, cool. Yeah, um, yeah. Just make it so simple. Yeah, Okay, sorry I couldn't be there, but it's fantastic to see this even if it's remote. Um, I've been thinking often about remote work and the role of the like stronger labor power right now in terms of basically shifting utility from, um, I guess, from wages and production and more towards amenity consumption, right? And so I was wondering, in particular, like if these decisions are being made by the workers as opposed to the firms, or to what extent they are, and to what extent does their you know position the labor market allow them to make those decisions rather than firms? Um, you know, like are you is your sense that basically workers are being compensated more from amenities rather than wages, and how does that relate to actual productivity? Because obviously utility is kept constant in your models within cities, but product you know the output or labor of productivity is going to change. Right. I think I think that's a that, I think that's an important question. I think the issue. I mean, this is, this is related to what we were discussing with Luis at the beginning, which is you know 
during the pandemic, at the impact in the pandemic, we were also at home. We were still getting our wage. Most most workers, they were not fired. They were still getting their wage. And so, you know, we got the benefits of staying at home, not having to commute, but the wage. As this thing evolves, right? I think it, the way I'm thinking about it is exactly what you said, which is we're seeing that part of the compensation of employees is going to be in these uh, non-pecuniary terms, basically, you know, the benefits of staying at home, the benefits of no commuting, et cetera. And so workers are going to start um, having to decide, do I want to be in a job that pays me a higher wage or do I want to be in a job that gives me that flexibility where I can stay at home or where I can don't have to commute every day, et cetera. And so I think we're starting to see these options, employers giving different options to workers about this trade-off. But this idea that, oh, we're gonna stay in a situation in which wages are gonna be as high as they were, but on top of that, you're gonna get all these uh, other benefits of not having to commute, et cetera, that seems uh, to me not very likely. And in fact, the data seems to suggest that it's starting to go away. Um, there's another question from Keith Waters. He is a baby. So um, he wants to know um, how the rents played out in cities that are low work from home, like Dallas. Yeah, Dallas. Dallas, <laughs> Dallas is, is, is giving us a little trouble. <laughs> Dallas. Uh, you know, Dallas, the problem with Dallas is that it's if you look at the occupation composition of Dallas, it should be a city where lots of people should be uh, working from home, but we don't see that that much. And so, and so I'm not, you know, we haven't been able to really kind of make, a, make sense of Dallas overall. I mean, the other problem with Dallas is that it has all these different kind of satellite cities where there's a lot of employment and there's kind of, they're growing. And so it's a city that it's a little bit in flux in terms of that. So, so maybe, uh, so, so we, we just need to investigate more data. Sorry, sorry, sorry not to have more, a more definite answer there. <laughs> yeah, Go ahead. Hi, yeah. I wonder if you know of any research going on into studying the pressures that the spreading out of labor has on, um, basically the local communities that people move to. So as an example, um, uh, I grew up like uh, like two hours from New York City. And so since the pandemic, it's been very common for a lot of remote workers to move into areas that until, until now are mostly like working class towns or working class like counties, typically more rural and whatnot. Um, and in effect, like driving up rent prices, driving up housing prices without contributing as much to the local economy um, as they would uh, in the city. So I wonder if you're aware of like what research there is going on into like modeling that or setting data on that. Right, so so, th so there's a bunch of people in, uh, in New York that have been studying this, in particular at Columbia Business School. Uh, Steen van Nuremberg has a, has a bunch of studies that has have exactly looked at these kind of Flattening. I mean, essentially, the, the what you're discussing is exactly that's the reason, that's the mechanism through which you get this flattening of the rent gradient that we were talking about. The, the, the deep down, right, in, in those graphs that I was showing, is exactly that, right? It's people going to those servers, living in those servers, and increasing prices there relative to the center, right? I mean, on the other hand, you know, the, the question, I mean, I think that the big problem for those communities is not so much. The initial impact, I mean, that may drive some people out, which is bad for the community. But I mean, in terms of the, for 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 the local authorities, et cetera, it's higher revenue, right? From, from housing uh, prices, et cetera. But the problem is that if it reverses, right? You drive people out and then it reverses and then you leave these communities that don't have the people, everyone left, right? And then now you don't have the revenue. And so that can be very bad for those potential, potentially for some of those communities. I haven't seen studies that address that point directly. 
But I think it's a it's an interesting topic of research for sure. Particularly kind of this impact of, you know, you change and then you have to change again. And that may leave you in a worse situation than where, than where you were originally. I think that's a good point. Um, there was one last question from Chris. He um, wanted to follow up on his previous question. Okay. Is, is the market power of white collar labor stronger in San Francisco than in New York City? Is it? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't. I have no evidence of that, but it may be. I mean, I don't know. I think. I think uh, some uh, finance industry people may have a uh, high bargaining power, but. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think bringing in uh, the, a detailed model and detailed evidence on differences in bargaining power and so to what extent some of this is going to be reflected in wages relative to, um, to, to changes in firm profits or firm characteristics is an interesting topic, right? So, so the, this bargaining between uh, the firm and the worker, and, and, and who's gonna who's gonna get the rents from this? Uh, I think that's an important issue. It doesn't affect the basic logic that I've been describing, in the sense that at the end of the day, whatever it is, you still have the externality, and you still have the effect that you should have on rents, right? So because that doesn't depend directly on what's the share of the wages that the worker gets, because even if it's in kind, as we were discussing, we're gonna have some of those effects. So, so that part, uh, I, in some sense, that's one of the benefits of looking at rents rather than looking at, for example, the evolution of wages in, in some of these things. But you, you, but you had a comment on the question. I yeah. was just wondering like, if the remote work influence on like the service industry, the hospitality industry, everything else is also contributing to that because right. like in places like New York, downtown has a lot of attractions that in Chicago, like it's, the loop doesn't always have, right? So right. Yeah, I mean, we go back to, the, I, I agree with that. Um, so, so that, so, so, so in, in my, in my um, agglomeration parameters, there were two parameters, right? So there was this delta, which tells you uh, if a lot of people go to the office, how much more productive am I, right? And so, so what's the effect on my wages? And then there was another one, which was this psi, right? And this psi exactly captures that, right? So it captures the fact that you know, going downtown is attractive for the worker. And I want to live, and so that may be a reason I want to live close to the city. Uh, and, and that is more attractive if more people go to, right? If, if, if downtown is active and fun rather than deserted, right? Then I get more out of it. So and, so, and so at the end of the day, this multiplicity versus no multiplicity of stationary equilibrium depends on the sum of those two things. So I don't really, I mean, this mechanism that we have you're gonna have it whether it's through wages, through that delta parameter, or through that C parameter. Now in New York, you're right, that C parameter is particularly high. Right. And so that's that that is a reason why uh, that that would push New York towards multiplicity, right? But not sufficiently, obviously. But you think Chicago is more? Chicago has Certainly lower C, right? But uh, lower C, and I think it has lower delta as well. So, so both. I mean, because the occupations are not, they don't, agglomeration effects in the occupations that are the largest in Chicago are not as strong as in finance, for example. All right, so I want to be conscious of time. We're already gone a little bit past. So Esteban, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, thank you so much. It's been very interesting and lots of questions. So Esteban is, is, is in the, at the university and hope we'll keep on visiting and so on. So don't be strangers, but thank you for being here with us today and for stimulating talk. Thank you. Thank you.